flowering leaves of all these life-giving trees that flow in the breeze, giving us the air to breathe, came from the seeds that sons and daughters had sown, passing down histories through stories, genes, and bones, hear the whispers of the past. Take your prologue, a generational creel through which memories are prolonged. So we reach down like nourishing waters to seek truths, except we receive nourishment when we're digging the roots. All right, good evening. Do you know where you are? We know where we are, and we're glad that they joined us. <laughs> Tonight is Tuesday, June 27th, and you are a lucky duck because guess what? You have about four consecutive weeks of Black Progen available to you as a genealogy uh, aficionado. We're so glad that you joined us tonight for our 36th episode of Black Progen Live, and we've got quite a bit of stuff to talk about tonight, so let's go ahead and get on going. Before we get in really good, just want to remind you to make sure that you join the conversation with us tonight. Feel free to tweet us at Black Progen, hashtag your comments, Black Progen. Also, if you're watching live, there is a chat room in the YouTube app. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see live chat. If you're watching on a computer, the live chat is to the top right-hand corner of the screen. The panelists, as well as the general public, will be there submitting their comments and feedback and laughs and whatever else they want to they want to send to us during the show. And we'll be sharing some of your comments live uh, while the show is being broadcast. Tonight's topic is help me get to my folks, easy ways to find people of color in online records. Are you tired of having to sift through tons of records just to get to the folks you know are yours? Join us as we talk our inside tips and tricks on narrowing down people of color in online record sets. That's the topic for the evening. Also want to do a reminder, get the latest and greatest from Black Progen in your inbox. Subscribe to The Lowdown today. Check the description of the recording of this and any Black Progen Live episode for the link. And if you subscribe to The Lowdown, you'll be able to get our blogs, podcasts, and more. Anything produced by this set of panelists, those who are part of Black Progen, our genia friends, and whoever else we just threw into the lawn yop known as the, the Lowdown by Black Progen. Also, don't forget, to check out the other 35 episodes of Black Pro Gen Live, be sure to check out the playlist following the show as you'll be able to get your fill of genealogy and family, hi family history research related tips and tricks. These are just a few of the episodes we already have done this year. We did People of Color in the West, which was California, Arizona, Nevada. We had a Slave Narratives episode, which was absolutely awesome. If you missed that, be sure to go back and watch that. That was probably my favorite episode of this year so far. Also, telling the story without boring your family. Making sure you don't put people to sleep when you start talking about genealogy at your family events. <laughs> and of course, we talked about the 10% free people of color. Those are just a few of the episodes from this year. We also have so many from the, the years previous. So be sure to check those out. And before we get jumping into the topic at hand, we want to go ahead and introduce the panelists uh, as they appear on my screen tonight. Let's see. I'm trying to think. Who has a birthday coming up next? Who hasn't had a birthday? It's a great question. Mine just passed. Mine too. <laughs> so did mine too. <laughs> exactly. So that's what I'm trying to think. Whose birthday? I'm team, I'm team Virgo. Okay, so he's he's later. Felicia is in April, so I'm trying to think who's true. You just had yours too. I'm an Aries baby, April all the way. Hey, I'm April. April. <laughs> January here. I think Bernice is. She's the beginning of the year too, right? No, she's no. at the end. Oh, all right. Well, resident Y chromosome, you go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm just going to get a stamp on my head that says resident Y chromosome. Good evening, everybody. My name is James Morgan III, and I'm coming to you from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Always a pleasure to be here. I actually wasn't supposed to be on tonight. I had some, uh, something else going on, but the genealogy guys just pulled me here into my, uh, my home office in front of the computer to talk to you. All right, we'll go next with Bernice Alexander-Bennett. 
Hello, everyone. Um, as you said, Bernice Alexander Bennett from Maryland. All right, with the birthday yet to take place. That's all right. That's all right. Uh, the last birthday girl that we had, I believe, was Teresa. So we'll go ahead with Teresa Vega. Teresa Vega, based in New York City, Radiant Roots Bariqua Branches is my blog. All right. And the other recent birthday girl would be Dr. Shelley Murphy. Greetings from Central Virginia, Family Tree Girl. Yes, look in some good light. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta keep talking about our light. All you had to do was say, Shelly, get some light. <laughs> Shelly, she came, she's like effervescent. She this is like her Beyonce lighting. That's what I'm gonna call it, her Beyonce lighting. <laughs> she's got her Beyonce lighting. All right. Uh let's see, who am I forgetting? Felicia is on mute. I don't know if she's ever gonna get out of her like namaste pose tonight. We'll see. Uh that's Felicia, <laughs> Felicia Addison, care of Oakland, California, eh? uh, and let's see, Renata. Good evening, this is Renata coming to you from Newport News, Virginia, not a Sue all over the internet, Into the Light is my blog, glad to be here tonight. All right, not a Sue is in the house. We also have True Lewis, also known as Nanny for the next couple weeks or maybe month <laughs> or so. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's me, True Lewis, from My True Roots. And stop on by and read something up on my granddaddy Ike. Is twenty three kids and three wives. I it's always something to tell about him. So I'm glad to see everybody out there on YouTube and Twitter. And just welcome. <laughs> wait, I, wait a minute. Did anybody else notice these these green glasses? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh. The on, on vacation. <laughs> you see, she got vacation glasses. She got nanny glasses, right? So, you know, when it when when the baby's not here, we get the white ones. But when the baby comes, we get green. Yeah, <laughs> so I got a whole lot of, up a bit. <laughs> she got we got a whole lot of Beyonce going on with the panelists tonight. It's Beyonce lights. It's Beyonce wait, 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 glasses. Wait, 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 wait. I, I'm not gonna be Beyonce. I, I could be Jay no, okay. Less, but I, you I can be, be okay. You can be. Let's see. BET Awards just came on. Maybe you want to be Luke James, Kofi Sorobe. I mean, you, you you can take your pick. I, I mean, I'll be Kendrick. I'll be, I'll be Kendrick or something like that. Oh uh, yes, his honest. video did just come out. I haven't watched that yet. Yeah, I have not yeah, watched I, that. I, yeah, I'll be I'll be Kendrick. You could be Kendrick Lamar. Awesome, awesome. All right. So chat room. Thank you so much, chatters, for joining us. Shannon Christmas, our genius, but is there along with Tyrone Craft, who joins us every single time. We also have Kristen, our buddy Kristen Clegg. Yvette Porter Moore is in the house. All right. I'll see yeah, you. Yvette. She's in PR right now. She's yeah, really she is in Puerto Rico. All right. Yeah. Uh, she's joining us from the from the from the house. Kevin Thomas, the other Y chromosome, is in the house. There's a few that have joined us. Clarice Mason from Fairfield. All right, Vallejo Fairfield, I see you. All right, Beth Wiley is in the house. Aya T, also known as Tammy Ozier from Atlanta. Hello, everyone. All right, so thanks so much for joining us. Let's hop right into the uh, content of the evening. Help me get to my folks. So the first question I have for the evening is. Why do you think beginners have challenges locating people of color in records? It's multiple. Yeah. yeah. I think there's just so much out there right now. You know, a lot of us, when we began our research, we did not start on the internet and the records we had access to were limited. But now there's just so much at everybody's fingertips but only a small percent that seems to pertain to people of color. So it's just harder to, for people to weed through and find what pertains to our ancestors. Well, I think it, it depends on what you're looking for. Just like you said, there's so, there's so much out there now online, but then again, you had the libraries that you could go to and see what kind of resources they had. I mean, the one thing though, is to understand that it, even if you're looking at the records, we were listed differently. So you mm -hmm. would see people of color listed as mulatto. You may see people of color listed with a C. You will mm -hmm. see people with a B or an N E G. And some people didn't know <laughs> what that meant. <laughs> but you know, of course, it's all people of color. If, if I could say something, I think a lot of what I find um, now 
is um, people starting off with bad techniques and not really um, honing their methodology on how they're searching for relatives. I mean, and, and that's that's just first. I mean, you may have somebody named uh, James Jackson who lives in, you know, uh, Morgan County or what have you, right? But does that mean that that's your person? Does that mean that just because, even if they are a, a, a person of color, you know, does that mean that that's necessarily your person that you're looking for? Um, that That's the thing that I find um, to be a common issue. And then when you go into a, a situation with preconceived notions also, um, and sometimes we can be very self-defeatist uh, just as human beings. So we say, well, there's no, there, there are no records on my my people. They didn't keep record good good records. Well, you well that's a problem right there. You're not even looking for records to that that may actually exist. So I, th I think part of it's just bad methodology. I also think a lot of people, and uh, and Bernice alluded to it a little bit, are relying so much on the technology and the online mm -hmm. things that are there, and then bringing in what James just said about a lot of people started not with good techniques and strategies or how to analyze a record. And I think it also makes them not per continue and pursue it. Or I, I had to watch my mouth. I was getting ready to say a bad word. Or they take, <laughs> or, I, I, or they take the oral history and, and it can't be wrong regardless of what evidence comes. And I think it creates challenges for themselves. And again, it's also coming down to not knowing how to do the basics. But then again, nobody was standing out on the corner handing out information on, hey, black folks or hey, people of color, come do your research. So. Where's our Where's our genealogical news boy, you know, who just stands out like, no, exactly. no, you're wrong. So we have to go in differently and learn how to get more, stay in the box and not jump out that box. So, you know, I think that that's some of the reasons. Teresa? I, I, I was. Uh, no, I was going to say another issue is that I think people tend to look, well, neglect the local uh, yes. geology um, mm -hmm. resources that we have and may focus only on the state or only on the the region. And I think we need to be, uh, you know, making people aware that the local level is extremely important. And some of those local historical societies um, specific libraries in, in the state might be of better use than, than as uh, Shelly just said, some of the, um, the online resources, you know, so it's just fine tuning where we should be looking. I agree. I think I would, I would just add to everything you all are saying, which is very important, is that folks often get so engrossed with the census that they neglect the town and the, the parish and the county like it's so oh the federal government has everything you know what i mean it's like you know just just kind of operating in that vacuum and then not realizing that there are so many individual places like you know the federal government is like one bucket but then you have another 20 that relate to the the municipality the church the organization the whoever that your your ancestor was involved in so i think this is a very very good discussion um that just to remind folks not to focus so much on even I would say even state level records, but and federal records, but the local level records, the county, the parish, the city, you know, the cemetery, the church, you know, all those all those places have have stuff. So just to have a, a little bit of a, a, a hilarious conversation, what are some examples of racial designations that you've seen for people of color in records? Oh, high yellow. <laughs> Dark. <laughs> Ginger cake. Believe it or not, oh, light grip, Bernice. Oh, light yes, light grip. Mm -hmm. but, but believe it or not, white. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Believe There's it or not. a lot of Spanish terms too. I was gonna like, say the los, los, Fargo, Negro, you know, yeah. los Castos. I was gonna say all the Los Castos, or you know, the the caste uh, system. The paintings. Yeah. The caste system, which is largely Mexican. Yeah. yeah. Had something like 70, 77 to seventy four different combinations. And Did these small these sets of paintings were circulated around so that people would be able to read those relationships. Which is mm -hmm. crazy to me. It's almost yeah. like making a, bl a blast at Sonic, right? You know, because whoever, <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy, but whoever got, okay, 
here you are, you're, you know, I'm going to pick out these two pencils and at this location, you're going to be this. And then another location, we're going to take this one out because you didn't show that quality that day. And then we're going to make you this. Right. Well, these are kind of close, but we don't really know. And then the third location, you're these three. So, uh, you know, I, what about copper? Didn't somebody have an experience with copper people? Uh, I've seen folks yellow. Uh, descriptions, I think, that um, um, uh, that was mentioned. Um, uh, gosh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm my, blanking my, on the name. My favorite. Uh, but I know it's, she was mentioning it. It comes up a lot of times when you're dealing with Native Americans. Uh, older records from like the 19th, 18th century, they'll bring up, bring up these issues of color and then these kinds of different, different spins on the qualities of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, w I would say that. And also my favorite is black hair and black eyes. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. Yes. One. Mm -hmm. wow. The fact that people have black eyes. I'm like, how do you have black eyes? Yeah, I'm trying to figure that right, out myself. Yeah. Um, right. But the reason why I bring this up is because that's that's a, that's one of the easiest ways that we're able to tell whether or not somebody is one of our people for the most part is basically how they've been mm -hmm. identified on records. But for some folks that could be a challenge because especially if you're looking maybe at free people of color or some other population where someone may have been mulatto for a number of years and then all of a sudden the lines blur and then they become white or people make the assumption that folks are white who are their ancestors without doing the proper exhaustive search to make sure to confirm that that's the case. How do people stop doing that? Because I've seen so many folks well, just say, well, they must have passed because this white family and they don't really check the deep, you know, how, how do you know? Well, well, one, well, one thing I think is, is that you have to always um, talk to your relatives um, who are living. Um, if you're blessed enough to be able to find pictures and whatnot, um, that's always a plus and as well as look at the social identity that the people have. I mean, I, I have um, ancestors for I have one ancestor in particular, um, Reverend Hightower that, that I uh, have researched. He's probably the best documented ancestor on my tree. And um, I mean, yeah, he was biracial, but socially and politically, everything he did, he did it as a black man. I mean, in terms of, from, from being a member, uh, minister in the AME church to the political causes that he was in, he had, he knew his father was white, but he, he identified as being a black man. Um, the last thing I'll say is I actually have a record, um, I think it was the 1910 census or something like that with my Glover, my Glover ancestors where um, Grandma Fanny, my great great grandmother, she was a black woman, you know, as we would say, you know, politically or what have you. Um, in, even in her face, her facial features, you can tell she's of African descent, but her mm -hmm. skin tone, her skin tone was, was pale, like pale, pale, ghost white. Right, yes, all her yes. children. She had children with a very dark skinned man. All her children were my color. So explain to me why all these people on the census record are listed as white in 1910, mm -hmm. because the census person looked at the mother and said, "Oh, she, her, yeah, she was right. Her color was white. All her kids were dark skinned people, but in the census record they're listed as white, which I thought was the funniest thing in the world. But that's a real record. If I wasn't astute enough to do my own research, and thankfully I knew some of these people and have their images and whatnot." Um, I would go, oh, they were passing. No, they, no way in the world they were passing. The census taker was lazy or, or, or he just looked at one person and, and said the whole house was, was white people. Well, James, I have actually seen a census form altered. And it looked like before wow. they microfilmed it that somebody wrote W where it was black. I, I think I posted that particular census form. Wow. And so some people responded saying they had seen the same thing. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've seen that once or twice myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, James talked about uh, the fact that, you know, he did additional research. Let's talk, let's talk specifics. What additional research do you do? It, let's say you've got family members that show up as mulatto and then you can't find them, right? You know, and maybe it's during a pivotal time period. We're talking, you know, between 1881 and 1899, you know, you, they somehow, you, you found them on an 1880 census, but 1900, you're, you're coming up blank. Mm 
but you see a white family that has similar names or you see another family that has similar names and but you know details and and you just automatically make the assumption because see what i mean by make the assumption is a lot of folks that are getting started with, ge with genealogy research are starting online and mm -hmm. they get these shaky leaf hints and we've all seen it right when you're researching people of color communities the hint comes out and here it is nobody people aren't even checking the details so i i would well, say, I maybe i'm answering my own question right yeah. because because you know they're not even checking the details they just see oh okay uh the the state and the county looks about right or maybe that's close by okay yeah i'm gonna go ahead and confirm that that's the right person but they don't actually go to the census page or the document page to make sure it's the right people that's that to me is, is step number one is yeah. you need to confirm you need to look at the actual document don't just accept a hint because right. you, your tree could be thrown completely off and then what makes it even worse is that when enough people accept that hint the algorithm gets messed up mm -hmm. and then it begins to suggest that to everyone so that it did, really doesn't crawl accurately anymore um, I, I guess that's kind of what I was um, getting at in the beginning about there just being so much out there online now. And when people are getting started, they don't have those research test techniques in place most of the time. And they're just grabbing it the first thing they see. I also think that all the wonderful shows that we have on television right now, they just kind of perpetrate that because we see on, you know, who do you think you are in all these shows that they just magically put a name in and right. that's the one right there there's you know they don't right. show the work of narrowing it down and really determining are you looking at the right person in the right time in the right place so people see that on tv they get their free ancestry account and they put in Tom Jones and click the first Tom Jones. There he is. <laughs> it's not a you. So, 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 so it wasn't it wasn't magical for you, Renata? No, not at all. <laughs> oh well, oh, I, I, it, maybe just me. I, okay. I was going to also add is that you know you have to insist on people looking at these for their ancestors over time. You can't just look at one record right. see they're white. Mm -hmm. You got to keep going backward and forward and and checking again people places location you know i and my family we have free people of color sometimes they're mulatto sometimes they're white sometimes they're black you know but and then and, um today i had a case where um family search released the 1885 new jersey census for newark and oh, i was wow. looking for my second great grandmother they were listed as O. i've never seen O. so we didn't know whether the census tick Taker, you know, listed them as white and then said, oh, maybe they're not, or O is other. Yeah, but 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 I've never seen that was the first time I actually saw O. Yeah. But we know they were mulatto going way back. But again, it's over time that we can see that. But I thought that well, was hilarious. I, was, I, have I, something, I have something really funny. I looked in some records and you know, they had to see. And someone decided that meant Canadian. <laughs> it was. It didn't oh, mean Canadian. Lord. And I'm so like, what Canadian? Well, that, I was going to say, C also is an issue when you're doing Indian territory research or people that were freedmen, because the yeah. you know depending on who the transcriber was, they could think that C was China, yeah. Canadian, yes. you know, Canada. <laughs> Uh, my favorite Indian territory becomes India, not Indian territory <laughs> or a birthplace. You know, so so I, I I bring this up because you know this is not just an issue of people of color. This is a how do I know I have the right people? But the the benefit that we have is that race was captured. You know, so in addition to that layer of yes, this person is black, we also have to take ourselves to that additional scrutiny of yes, okay, the person is identifying as a person of color, but do the age is the age range match up? Do the birth locations match up? Do the family members match up? Like we still need to go through that process, you know, Absolutely. because you know, because white, you know, people who are doing predominant European research, they have issues 
struggling with identifiers because they may not be able to tell right. one Tom Jones from another Tom Jones. <laughs> so, you know, so that that's the, you know, if you don't pick up anything tonight out of what we're saying, you need to really scrutinize the documents that you're finding instead of thinking that everything is going to fit nicely in together. You right. know, you've got to challenge those, those outliers. You've got to challenge those clues or those things that are popping up in that record. Because if you don't, you, I mean, for instance, uh, me and Ellen know someone who for years refused to acknowledge, she she got back so far and she refused to accept that this mulatto family was her family. She, everything matched, the names, the ages, everything, location, but there, but no, 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 nobody in my family is, is, is mulatto at all. That that's never been passed down, whatever. She left it alone for how, for years, right? Until one day, she was sitting in the family history center and two older black ladies were sitting by her at the computer. And she overheard, you know, a whole bunch of these white folks don't know they black. <laughs> <laughs> and she says she took that as a sign from God that she, <laughs> that she needed to accept these people. And she discovered that she was a descendant of free people of color and she had no clue. But she got hung up on racial designations. It, racial designations. It goes both ways, right? So, right. So, 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 oh, you got. So, oh, 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 that oh. was that was just tamped down. So she had no no basis to even say, you know, somebody mentioned something. Nobody mentioned anything. And then also, like, don't don't just run by those transcriptions. I mean, I did a blog post recently on a real howler of a name that I found on Family Search. And when you look at the actual document, which now the court for the Puerto Rican civil registration has been pulled, the images have been removed from family search while they get through some litigation there. Uh, but you could see when you look at the actual document, you know, what, what was there is not there. And then you can't find people because of spelling. Uh, but the issue of colors is, is, is a really pertinent one. And you know, you, it, it takes time. And if it takes time, that's okay. You but know, it's if you don't find it out right away, keep at it. It's I, I interesting. That. That's not the first place I'd look. I'm following names and ages. Race is typically not what I'm sent, you know, focused on at all early on. It's yeah. almost ignored early on. I've got to find the family unit, find the neighborhood, mm -hmm. the location, mm -hmm. and other things because the census are so, and I'm going to call it messed up. Yeah. And, it, and there's so much inaccuracies in there. That's your shaky leaf right there. Your hint is actually the census. We get a whiff every 10 years on where people might be basically one day a time. One of the things I always share is to get a hold of the census guide instructions. You can download it. And all those codes like the C or the O, you can find out exactly what that stuff means and what that census taker was supposed to be collecting or supposed to be doing. Doesn't mean they're not going to alter things, but if you're able to follow, at least you'll know more about what you're looking at. And a lot of researchers ignore all of the columns on the right. right. That's where your next hint is from, your next lead. Find out where's that veteran? Did they own property? You know, this, that, and the other. So there's so many clues that are not getting carried through. And right. it create then people are creating their own challenges, not knowing the basics. I, I would I, add, I, oh, go ahead. Okay, Teresa and I then would, uh, Bernice. Okay, I would also add that in addition to census records, there are also other corresponding records, church records that might sure. list um, ethnic affiliation. I always... I'm like a, a, a strong proponent of newspaper archives and Come on now. researching at that. I just bring it out there to find this information yeah. because sometimes stuff is very hidden away. Um, you have to look at it as it's, it's, it's a treasure you know, hunt. You yes. have to go deep at the local level, look at church records, look at James will tell you social organization, fraternal organizations, those newspaper archives to find out a lot more uh, information. I know on some of my early blog posts for uh, my folks in Newark, um, I, I found so much stuff just at the local historic uh, society in Newark, going through their vertical files, just, just looking for 
documents that I happened to find um, actual photos of uh, the house that my third great uncle built in Newark, which was an underground railroad house. It, you have to be open and 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 do an exhaustive search. Don't just stay in one focus. Mm -hmm. Stay in, you know, just on the internet looking at it, the ancestry records only or family search records. You really need to broaden your base. If I could piggyback on that, um, uh, I think no, you can't. Oh, it's Bernie's was before you, right? And I really want to just piggyback on what was just said by saying we have to we have to look at historically what was going on at certain times. You know, you had segregated schools. Fact. Why not look at the different school systems? Look in the phone directory. Some of the phone directories will have C, that is a colored person. So they identified that. We just have to remember that we were in, and in some times, you may say you're still in some segregated areas of which you can say these are the only areas where you're going right. to find black people. And that's where you look for the records. Now, my ancestors on my paternal side are from Edgefield, South Carolina. That's a very large slave owning community of which they have records. You walk into the historical society and you give them a surname and they will say black or white and they'll bring you the folder. And so you have to be able to go in there and say, this is what I'm looking for. They know where the information is and they can provide that. So that's kind of piggybacking on what Teresa has also said. The churches, obviously, you're going to look at those churches. Look at what kind of books they put out. The AME church, study it. Know what's going on in the black newspapers. Even if you're doing genealogy bank and you're searching on the old newspapers, in your search engine, you put in, if you want to know about slaves or you want to know about a black person, you put it in, you identify what you're looking for, and it'll come up. James, go right on ahead. I'm sorry. Miss Bernice jumped in front of you. I'm sorry. I was rude. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, no, I no, the thing I was going to say was that uh, you, you also remember, too, like when you're talking about people of color, um, the oppression, political oppression that, that we faced. Um, in this country, oftentimes there's there's often a response to that from the community, and your relative may actually have taken part in it. Um, whether it was like 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 Bernie said, uh, being a part of certain organizations, or even just um, just actually being a part of that protest tradition as well, um, you you'll be surprised. I mean, sometimes in our families today, we don't realize that in those old black and white photos of you know, Marcus Garvey or whoever, you know, your grandmother or grandfather might be there. And one thing that I've always said, I'm going to do this. I haven't been successful yet. I keep saying, I'm going to find somebody with a family tree or uh, doing genealogy research who has um, ancestors who are in Marcus Garvey's organization. There's got to be, and we know that there's records of, that exist there, right? If you're, if you have a relative, let's just say in, like New York, for example, if you have ancestry going back into New York and the Harlem Renaissance, whatever, Look at those organizations, and, and you'd be very surprised. At, you go, wait, I didn't know Grandpa was in that. I didn't know Grandma was was you know like you know the Underground Railroad or, or what have you. You'd be very surprised at how brave some of our ancestors were, and a lot of times they left paper trails. Well, and I that also adds to if you're interested in organizational research, that goes back to the last episode we just had that talked all about you know religious fraternal social organizations and how to research those organizations. There, there's a tie right back to that if you have right. questions on how to do that research. Um, I, uh, the next question I have, and this is a great discussion because I think this this goes across the gamut. This is this is you know I think the biggest takeaway from this particular section is don't assume. You know, don't just accept the, the clue, don't just accept the hint without really analyzing every single piece of that document. And when it comes to the census records, we we just advocated to everyone to make sure that you're not just reading those first five or six columns that you're, and, and really honestly, let's be real. A big clue, especially if your family was from a major metropolitan area and they had street numbers and streets that they lived on, that will help you confirm whether or not these are the right people or not. You know, if you know your family did not move or let's say you're looking at the 1940 census and these folks were living in the same place in 1935 and you found your ancestors in 1930 and you're looking up in the 1940 and you're like, well, wait a minute, the street is different. Have you gone and done research on the, the street names in that particular location and whether or not they changed between that time period? 
you know, that's something to consider. Have you, that's part of the exhaustive search. In addition to that, right, confirming through address would be one thing, you know, then the next piece is, as Michelle identified, is that whole other side of the, of the census form that uh, the census schedule that gives you occupation, it tells you a number of different things. That's another place that you can look to confirm whether or not you have the right Tom Jones, because Tom Jones could be black and Tom Jones could be white, right? So <laughs> the next question I have is let's talk common names such as Tom Jones. How do you know for certain you have the right person of color? Because you know, we have a lot of George Washingtons. This is where it's important to know, you know, if you know family members, uh, names of names and ages of family members, because lots of families have the same names, uh, unfortunately for us. And um, also something I wanted to chime in and say is that it also will vary depending on what period of time you're looking at, the types of records that you should look for. Um, and one of the things that I, I use heavily because I have ancestors from North Carolina is, you know, right when I got to that line many, many years ago of trying to determine if my great grandfather had been enslaved, um, I was, I learned about the cohabitation records and that was actually the confirmation for me, um, not knowing anything about my ancestors before I started researching, didn't know if they were slaves or not. Um, when I found the cohabitation record naming him and my great grandmother um, and saying that they were lately slaves but now emancipated, um, that was it for me to know, yes, that they were enslaved and yes, that I had the right couple um, for my great grandparents. So that's not something you're going to find if you're looking for ancestors in 1900 but if you're you know on that 1870 line and you're trying to figure out which way to go that can be a helpful type of record to use excellent well, point yeah yeah I think I think that's great. You're, we're talking about time periods, right? We've got, people have got to learn what was available at certain time periods. You know, it's just when, when you know, um, I know we've all seen that person that you know gets their bubble burst or feels like the sky is falling when they figure out that that birth, marriage, and death certificates didn't exist since you know Jesus was alive. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? It's just yes. like, what do you mean there were no death certificates mm -hmm. in 1840 for slaves? You know, and it's like, but sweetheart, no, like that's, that's not the case. And so, you know, it's, it's learning what was available when, and I think the benefit for us researching now is the fact that we do have racial, we have records broken down by race. You have mm -hmm. the colored book of marriages, yeah. you have, you know, uh, uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, you have these things set, 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 set apart, but um, you know, we've, we've, we've got common names that someone in the chat room says, why in the world did I bring up George Washington? Cause, cause that name, I mean, think I, we have all seen a George Washington. I met yeah, my yeah. first George white Washington last year. I had never met a Washington male that wasn't a person of color. And he's, he is a descendant of, uh, George's brother, Samuel. His name is Walter met and went in the house and i told him you are the first white male washington i had ever seen in my life so I've i mean it's oh. such a common name and mm -hmm. i wanted to make one last thing we're not i'm sorry is okay. people have to think about every record creates a record and it's almost like a drill we've done it you've done it you know if you get a record you got to figure out why was this record created what was the law at the time what was going on in the community and everything mm -hmm. else that we're talking about. But every record is probably going to stem another record. And it's another way where people get caught and not research, and especially people of color, they'll stop at a death certificate. And a death certificate probably creates another five, six, seven, eight records, if not 10. So a good tagline to keep is every record creates a record. The death certificate is exactly what I was going to bring up. And so yeah. James, I'm, James, I won't say much, but um, I wanted, I wasn't going to say it as well. Every record creates a record. That's a good one. Um, That's the Maggie tag. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but um, yeah, death certificates have so much information and they give you confirming information, but they also can often lead you to another generation. 
Um, and so I, we were talking about time periods and I was just going to say, you know, in North Carolina, you know, death certificates were mandatory as of 1913. So if you're looking for someone that would have died in that area or after 1913, you definitely want to seek out a death certificate and pull all the information that you can. So I just wanted to reiterate the importance of knowing what's available, when it's available, and who it's available for. I, I would also chime in too that the only way you'll know that is if you go to search the information out. Yeah. You can't expect for it just to fall in your lap. Oh, I'm on the census in, you know, online and it's going to tell me that 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 vital records existed. No, no, no. You've got to go municipality. Like and I think some of this also goes back to researching and really knowing the locations that our ancestors lived in. What were the counties or parishes that were in existence that created that area? And what where did those documents go once that municipality the, the boundary lines were changed? Then you know, it, it's not, you know, isolating ourselves to the point where we feel like every federal record has got to be the end all be all. You know, the fact that we've got all these little striations all over the place. And um, and I think in terms of common common names, you know, how do you know for certain you have the right person of color? We brought up uh, uh, naming patterns in our families, right? Uh, you're looking at places, locations, you have a timeline established of where your family was living at a particular point in time or your hypothesis of where they were. Something more than just, I know these are the people uh, because <laughs> the chat room has me cracking up about folks going in and, and taking people's ancestors and attaching them to trees and they're the wrong people. Yeah, I hate that. Yeah, well, one thing I was gonna say was that um, I think that we also have to remember too um, when you're looking at people, especially if you're trying to sift through um, if they're a person of color or not, if they're the right person, um, is remembering that at a cer at certain points in time in many um, municipalities that you had a lot of you had a lot of covenants going on where they wouldn't actually allow for certain groups of people, um, primarily blacks, to be um, to become residents or homeowners in a, in a particular area. Um, and so, if you see, um, and, I, and I know the DC area was really good for that. Um, if you um, are seeing a person with your ancestor's name in a certain area that you know maybe they ha maybe they had a covenant, maybe they didn't, you know, but if they did, that's something to be, to be looking out for also and looking at, again, who else is living in that general region, um, uh, who's on the same street. I mean, and these, again, these are, these, are, these are very basic techniques, but they, they, come, they, they come in handy. To, I mean, you just wouldn't believe. I mean, for me, I've had, I've had, I've had situations where I've been looking for ancestors, and I'm not really sure 100% if this is, the, if this is the, the person I'm looking for. And then I turn the page and I go, oh, well, I know that person, be, they married this person later. Oh, they live in the same neighborhood. Ah, you know, so, so that's something to be cognizant of. Um, and I, just to add on to what James is saying is that you can then expand that into other, other resources, like say the Sanborn maps, or if you know that there's, um, these kind of redlining laws, you can take a look at those laws to see, well, exactly who were they targeted at or did something come up that caused this to happen? I mean, not to get, go off on a tangent, but just to kind of help verify what it is you're looking at, build up that context so that you know you feel more confident about moving forward with the story that you're building around your family. And nothing takes the place of being able to go to the location if you're able. Amen. So, you yes. know, if you're close enough or you can plan that little um, genia vacation to the county that your ancestors are from, you know, I was just thinking about the, the marriage records and the death certificates that um, I'm very fortunate. I'm three hours away from my main county of research and I go there often. And just to be able to go to register of deeds and 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 pull the pull the I don't know what you call those drawers their drawers mm -hmm. you know to pull the drawers the drawer for green and flip through each and every original marriage certificate so something could have been missed on an online search but when I'm going you know page by page and I'm looking at every name I'm just browsing but I'm finding ancestors of mine you know in that way and you do the same thing with the books with the death certificates in it so you know never um, I guess settle for online research if you have the capability of going to the county 
Yeah, uh, uh, Karen Galloway just wanted to be sure she wanted, there are two terms I think we need to de define for people. We need to talk about redlining and what that means because we can't assume that, that, that the viewers know exactly what that is. And, and that basically is, well, actually, Dr. Sacco, can you elaborate on what redlining is? Oh, you're, you're on mute, Ellen. It's a set of laws that were created to keep a particular population out of a given neighborhood or area. So it could be against black people, it could be against Asian, it could be, and it, and it all depends on the time and place of a, given, of, of, of a location where you're looking. You know, they're, they're not, they're not um, they all don't run the same, they, they, they come up at different time periods, they're variable. So that's why there's no one, there's no one thing. And, and, and then also they're, they're done, it's also done informally and still done informally today, you know? Absolutely. And then the, the second question, which was from the chat room from Karen Galloway, wanted to know what is a covenant? Well, I guess I should answer that since I used it right. Um, yes, a, covenant, a covenant is basically where you have, it's a, similar to redlining, except um, it's, it's a covenant that's placed in general by the homeowners in a particular neighborhood, not necessarily by the government. But the people who live in the area say, hey, if you're going to move in here before you purchase this house, we require you to sign this document that says you'll cut your grass on Wednesdays, you'll make sure your flowers are watered, and if you decide to sell it, you will not sell it to any blacks, gays, or Jews. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, in fact, when I was researching my, my own house, uh, I noticed that there were restrictive covenants. And, you know, I, do I dove right in for looking for Negro colored, anything I could find. So I could be like, oh, come on, neighborhood that's predominantly black now. We got to strike this from the, you know. Okay. But thank God they didn't have that. Okay. But but still, um, that's something that's something to consider. Uh, let's see. Uh, chat room is flying with co with commentary there's a lot of there's a lot that they're discussing so before we get to comments from there uh i think we touched a lot i think we touched on some really good areas in terms of narrowing down people with common names uh examples of racial designations challenges that beginners might have what are critical resources uh specific to people of color so what's in your you know what what are you using you know when, when you are hitting that search box and you're trying to hone in on, on a particular group are you going through the african-american collection link on ancestry or are you going directly to the u.s census records uh are you uh typing in the race or nationality uh category on the search search field are you putting in negro colored or black in that area when you're searching for a particular group of people or you know whatever the ethnic the group is what what do you do you know if we if if I gave you the Ask Mariah name right now, what would you do? One, one thing I do, if, if you're talking about enslaved ancestors or, or people who lived during that time period, um, one thing I'm doing is I'm also looking for white people with similar surnames or, or in the same general area. Um, because, uh, you know, for most of us, that's an unfortunate fact that we have to deal with in our ancestry. Um, I found a ton of, I, I, I literally was able to find three generations of my family laid out in black and white, how they were related just by finding their former slave owners probate record. Literally found three generations of my family in one day, in one sitting. And, it, and he wrote it out for me. That, you know, that's one thing I guess I can thank him for, right? Um, but if I had never looked for this man whose name was Moses Weems, and I knew he was white, I knew he was in the area, but as soon as I looked in the probate record, ta-da! Now it took me to read 221 pages, and I remember that distinctly, um, but the, the, the time it took me to read all that information and to, to decipher it is time that, yeah, I won't get back, but it was so worth it in the end because it gave me a starting point to now I know who my ancestors were in 1851 when he died. And now all I had to do was try to trace the lines down. And that's why my family tree expanded tremendously after I was able to do that. So that's one thing I would recommend, especially if you're looking at smaller locations or, or, or you have very unique surnames. I would say the first thing I start off with is based on their age or the era. And I start building that plain old basic timeline and think you, a lot of us go to census first. Yes. Based on this age, what census are they going to appear in and start mm -hmm. outlining what records I'm going to have to go look at. So typically the census are pretty good to start off and do the basic vital statistic records also, birth, death, marriage. Then if I'm researching Virginia as an example, I'm gonna hit the Library of Virginia first if it's people of color or I'm gonna hit that local library. And again, start outlining 
what am I looking for? And if I'm missing anything, then I got to find out where that information could be a different record somewhere at a different location. I pulled somebody's will and their whole estate papers who was a slaveholder um, in West Virginia and his whole family file and everything is at Duke university. So you have to be able to ask the questions of where these things might be. And sometimes Google, who is our friend, the simple question there might give you another lead to go look for something. And then again, you want to soak up whatever local resources you can get access to. And if you don't show up and stand at the historical society or the church door, then you need to connect with somebody in that area to help you with that. And, yeah. and just to add to what Shelly's saying is that sometimes even with three, you can have families with the same name and you may want, wind up having to build out a tree for like three generations just to make Correct. sure to be sure, like, do I have the right people? So sure. expect that. Don't don't say, mm -hmm. oh man, I, I can't deal with this or I don't want to do this or that it can't be, or it's, a, it's just a step, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. I just want to add uh, to, to what Shelly said about the plan. I mean, you come up with your research plan and then you start determining, well, where should I look first? I'm a big obituary person. I want to mm -hmm. see what's in the obituaries because so, they... Yeah. <laughs> that's those, a great... That's those great. obituaries yeah. really will lead you to other areas. And yes. so if I can go to legacy, <laughs> At yeah. dot org. I look for an obituary, put that person's name in there. They're going to tell me the church. They're going to tell me other family members. And right there, I have a, a at least something that has grounded me in a direction that I, I feel I need to go into. And not only the obituaries, but funeral programs, mm -hmm. you know, not, yes. not everything has hit the newspaper, but, you know, we have funeral programs and there are lots of databases now that are um, digitizing them or like the one I have that just will make it available to you. I also wanted to say it's a little broad, but I have had a lot of luck with just doing Google searches with the information I know. So the name, the location and and maybe colored or Negro or something like that. And it will then bring me to some sites that have information uh, on who I'm looking for. So that has worked a lot for me. And if I can just plug one more thing in, um, I was just today or yesterday looking at um, some information in the Southern History Collection at UNC. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at, um, which is very valuable broadly, but especially if you have ancestors from North Carolina. And I was looking at a family collection, and Shannon knows about this already. Um, and I was just looking at someone's papers on a family connection. It was a white man's papers. And one of the items in the collection was a register of free Negroes in Brunswick County, Virginia. And there was absolutely no reason that I could see for that to be there, except that it may have been misfiled. Um, so I'm planning to contact them tomorrow to check on that. But that's just to say, you just kind of never know <laughs> where something is going to turn up. And I don't know if Brunswick County has it, if they're missing it or what the situation is, but there was just nothing that we could see that made mm -hmm. it right for that to be in, in that collection of papers. So that, just keep your that, eyes open. I, Brunswick, I, Brunswick I, County is where my grandmother was born. I have ancestors back, from there also. Go, going all the way back to the 1700s. That's where my, my, my father's mother is from. We'll I, I would also add that, of course, the Freedmen Bureau records, um, you know, they also have uh, insurance and banking records you can look at. There's the United States Colored Troop records, military records. Um, mm -hmm. You also have a lot of new online, like the Hein Online website documenting the South. I, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's so many more places to look, especially yes. for those ancestors who have a slave background. You know, we have mm -hmm. to dig deep. Uh, James had previously mentioned locating his family's last slave owner. I mean, that's something that I hate to say it. I know with the research I do on my family, uh, again, I'm the descendants of slave owners and slaves. I treat those slave owner families like they're my actual family. That's you your know? family. 
You oh, have to they reset. are. Well, well you know you what? You have to. But yeah. you, you definitely have to. But I do it from the perspective of I can Google Robert King Carter and find out zillions of information on him. But I look at that information. I can go back to England easily. Yeah. But I'm writing a blog post now looking at my Malagasy line from Shirley Plantation. But it's from the perspective of looking at what I know about him, what I know about plantation management, punishment, whatever that my ancestors, you know, had to deal with because that's real. So we need to start looking at these slave owner families deep because it, as James says, it might be in a probate record that I find someone. It might be yes. in records, you know, just, just regular records detailing, you know, everyday situations at Shirley Plantation. You know, um, given what Renata and Shelley said, I, I have five colonial lives in Virginia, okay? I need to plan a month in Virginia, but Northern to Central Virginia, five colonial lines. And it means going to those University of, of, of uh, Virginia, Richmond, Charlottesville, College of William and Mary. I mean, it's, you know, there's so many places at the local level that you have to look yes. in terms of both sides, slave owner and slave. I would I would also chime in um, to into this discussion. I think we we also have to talk about newspapers, um, and their and the fact that there were colored news sections yes. that were relegated to certain areas, and they would talk about the happenings that took place in the quote unquote colored community in that location. And I think newspapers are so just overlooked in the genealogy community. I really think that a lot of people don't use them a lot. Even, you know, I think folks get discouraged because they may search for their family's names and nothing pops up rather than looking contextually around the, the municipality that they lived in, you know, or maybe the plantation, just searching for the plantation name or maybe the former slave, you know, the former owner of that plantation, you know, and it may mention the Negroes. It may not say exactly who you're looking for, but it may just talk about what was going on in that community. So that is something I think that um, that that we definitely should hit on. There are a number of different um, websites. Oh, yeah. We 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 have a you know we already have a show on our online uh, genealogy toolbox, which we could we could spend the next fifteen years sitting here talking about uh, about the different websites we use. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. Oh, oh no, I was going to say one, one one thing that I would also say uh, talking about newspapers and periodicals. Um, that I've I've actually have been able to find uh, had some success with this is finding out not just what where your ancestors are mentioned in the newspapers but even being able to find out what newspapers and periodicals they subscribe to um, and in some cases it maybe they even worked for but I, I have several ancestors where I've been able to find that they were they were subscribing to the Chicago Defender they were actually subscribing to the Christian Recorder okay to the Southern Christian Recorder this it, they're subscribing to a lot of these different um, uh, uh, papers, which can also tell you a little bit about um, their political orientation and whatnot. And a lot of times these newspapers would even um, say in there, they'll say, these are the people who subscribe to this newspaper this month. These are the prominent members of your community. And I found those, you know, a, a lot of the people don't talk about those lists, but I think that they're very important because it can kind of show you um, where your ancestors were, where their mindset was at. And oftentimes you may even find them writing to the editor. You may find them, you know, write, writing in. And, I, and I've been very successful at that. And I think more people would, would be if they looked, looked at those. I agree. Uh, a really great question that just came into the chat room um, from Kevin Thomas. He says, as a newbie, just under a year, do you all suggest picking one person and exhausting everything about them individually or be more global in terms of searches? That's a great question. But I think I would have more questions. I think if he limits just on one person, there's going to be so many other people coming up along the side that he's going to ignore that might link to the one person. So I would have to say he should look a little more globally. But I'm saying globally that it's not just one person. It's relationships. It's different locations and things like that not just that one location. 
I think because of the nature of how we organize our genealogical records right now, being online, it makes it hard to stick to one line. And because we operate with the fan principle a lot, or most of us, you know, who are on the panel during the research, I think all of us do, uh, we find it challenging just to focus on one line. I would say typically the way that I research is if I'm looking on a particular line of my family for that particular night, I will stick to them. And then I stick my flag in the moon and I say, okay, I'm done with that. I've exhausted everything or I'm just tired of looking at at y'all names. I'm going to move on to someone else. And then I may take a trajectory down another aisle, but you you basically just have to, I feel like you just innately, you know, okay, I've exhausted that for this evening. Uh, But I I think you also can't be short-sighted enough to just think that you don't need to gather those little crumbs along the way on the other, on the people, on, you know, on, on various folks that you may not be sure about that may kind of come together later and, and make a, a, you know, make something that you didn't realize was there. So uh, I, I think, yeah. I think that's a, it's a great question. It really all depends if, if you've got a good question. Yeah, if you've got ADD and you know you can't do it, then just you know for two weeks, give yourself a two week deadline. Okay, I'm just gonna focus on George Washington, or or you know. go for specific records on yes. that one line and then stop. And I post it in there, and I always come back to Bernice when she talks about DNA and the emotional side. Genealogical research is emotional. Because you're going to be faced with not finding things. You're going to find things that are inaccurate. And then you're going to find things that you don't even think are yours, but you take them anyway, you know, until something tells you different. So I think people have to be prepared. And if you stay focused on one thing, you're going to burn out quickly and not be able to look at other resources and things that are coming to you per se. So I hope who who asked that question would be able to research, you know, a little more broadly and not just focus on one line. And take good notes. Yeah. And take I, good notes. Absolutely. I, I think too, um, I think I also and I see what you're I see you raise your rose your hand, uh Bernice. Um I think what I do is when a new record set comes out, I exhaust that. Yeah. And if I get a new clue that comes from that, then I branch off for just that one particular yeah. thing. But I focus particularly like, let's say they do uh, like Ancestry is releasing. Um, they just updated the Louisiana statewide death index on, on family search. And you can actually see the certificates that they've digitized. If you go to the family search library now, you can't see them at home, but you can actually see them at the family search library. So, all right, they've added another five years. Okay. Let me search all my surnames, all of my people in that, in that database. If something new pops up, of course, then I might go to a census. I might go to other stuff bouncing off of that, but I'm going to exhaust that database as much as I possibly can for however the number of, you know, um, however, however long. Bernice. Yes. For me to respond to that question, I would say, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And that will determine whether you are looking at multiple family members or you're looking at one family member. But if you don't know what you're looking for, you can be all over the place and you won't accomplish anything. So you want to first start off with what's the question? What am I looking for? And then determine, do a cluster of people make sense? Or does it make sense for me just to look at that one person? All right. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to uh, viewer comments in the chat room for this evening. Karen Galloway uh, noticed Negrillion and Negrise for a racial designation. (laughs) You know what? We actually have a restaurant in D.C. called Negrillion. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder if they got it from that. Who knows? Uh, Yvette Portamore says, assuming one's race stays the same is a beginner's challenge. I, I agree with that. Linda Sims chimed in. My mother-in-law's father listed himself as black, even though he was white because her mother slash his father was black. Uh, Kevin Thomas says, took me a bit of time to realize I had the wrong person on my tree. Granddaddy couldn't be a daddy at five years old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you never he know. He is not alone. He is not alone. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
No, oh, my goodness. The oh, ones that get me are the births that happen after the person's deceased. Oh, right. yeah. I can't stand that on a tree. Oh, you want to talk about something that grinds my gears? Oh, that grinds every yeah. sing single gear for me. Oh, my goodness. So great viewer comments. Great viewer comments. Thanks so much, you all, for providing us your feedback. And now it is time for your favorite portion of the show. Of course, every portion of the show is your favorite portion of the show, but your especially favorite part of the show is our segment called Ask Mariah. Ask Mariah is where you, our viewers, have the opportunity to send us your questions, queries, conundrums, whatever about your ancestors, and you, we, you get to watch the panel work it out live. Uh, you know, our thoughts and tips and tricks for you moving forward. As always, I have to remind everyone that our uh, panel has not seen the uh, query. We never have. I cannot release that information to them because they are crazy and they will try to research it to death. So just so you know, this is the first time they are seeing the information and this is the first time they're able to chime in. And tonight's Ask Mariah is from Judy Morgan. Her question is... I like her already. <laughs> you liked Judy already. All right. So Judy's, yeah, Judy's yeah. question is, I am interested in knowing more about my paternal grand, uh, I'm sorry, my paternal great grandmother, Bessie Virginia Morgan, knee little, born about 1888, Edgefield, South Carolina, died 1935, Brooklyn, and the little family. So her question re is regarding, she wants to know more about her paternal great grandmother, Bessie Virginia Morgan, knee little, born about 1888, Edgefield, South Carolina, died 1935, Brooklyn, uh, and more about the little family, which would be her family. Now, in terms of what she knows, she's got the earliest census record she can find on her is 1910 in Edgefield uh, with her husband, Wallace. She has a death certificate, um, but aside from that, there are no other records where she is with her parents. Ellis Little, born about 1869, died in 1932, and Sarah Little, Nee Anderson, 1878 to 1940. I have a death certificate for both of uh, her parents who moved to Augusta, Georgia. So did Bessie and died there. Their names are Bostick and High. The names Bostick and Hightower also seem to be closely associated with the Little family. So just to review, she's got a 1910 census in Edgefield, and then she's got an Ellis Little, Sarah little knee anderson uh she's got birth certificates for both of uh bessie's parents um she, and who moved to augusta georgia as did bessie of course before she died in brooklyn and they died in augusta georgia the names bostick and hightower seem to be closely associated with the little family uh moving forward she what she's done she's followed up with dna matches appear to be from the little line but she can't find the exact link she found an ellis uh, and Sarah Little living in Augusta, Georgia, who she's extensively researched, but they do not have a direct link to Bessie. She's checked the Augusta Chronicle for obituaries. They did not uh, confirm parent-child relationships. Sarah's age is also questionable if she is truly Bessie's mother. And lastly, she has searched for Bessie and her parents by only first name and came up with an Ellis born in 1860, Sarah born in 1872, Bessie born in 1886, and James 1895 in Edgefield, South Carolina, identified as servants with the last name Frazier to the Norris family, was unable to confirm anything from this find. She also has a Jimmy Little born by 1894 listed on the 1910 census as a brother. All right. That is our case for this evening. Go ahead and dive on in and let me know if you need to see any of these slides again. Was her husband's name Wallace? Did you say that or not? Uh, you're was talking Morgan. Bessie? Was Bessie's husband Wa Wallace Morgan? Let's see. Is Judy in the chat room? I do not see her. So we will have to see if we can find. Look, look back on that second I have slide. A, I have a Wallace I have a Bessie Virginia Little married to Wallace. Yes, Morgan. yes, Wallace, yeah. Wallace. Yeah, nineteen ten in Edgefield. Her husband Wallace. Okay. Yes. And they had seven children. Okay. So yes. she's trying. So just for clarification, if you go back to the first slide, she's is she trying to connect parents to Bessie? That's what it sounds like to me. Okay. So parent, and she noted on the last slide that she did find a brother. So has she researched the brother to see if anything else appeared or 
if there were other siblings? Okay, uh, let's see. She's got, I don't think she's entirely sure that she's got okay. the right Ellis and Sarah. That's the way that this this read to me. I think it sounds like it, she's got Ellis Little, Sarah Little, Nee Anderson. She's got them death certificates for both of her parents who moved to Augusta, Georgia. So did Bessie and died there. Um, I think she's got death certificates for these folks, but I don't think she's found them on a census. That, that's what it sounds like to me. Has she looked in other places other than Edgeville? For example, Greenwood County, or Aikens or Abbeville, they may have moved because you're talking about Edgefield County, which could be very large. Uh, so I would suggest that she look in some of those other smaller areas. Uh, also, if she has not contacted the Edgefield uh, Historical, I mean, excuse me, Edgefield District Genealogical Society, I would definitely recommend that she contact them. I have found them to be extremely helpful uh, as far as helping you even take it back. Stuff that you didn't think you could find, they may, they may have information on it because they do maintain surname files so that she could go to the website, put in the surname she's looking for and see if they even have her surname. And then you will find that connection, the Edgefield and the Augusta, uh, Georgia connection, and definitely the high towers. I know some of the high towers and the Bostick. So, I mean, she's right in the area where those, those connections should be there to kind of help her pull it together. I would okay. also say that Bostick's ended up in New Orleans. There's a whole mm -hmm. slew of Bostics there. They they married into my family, um, mm -hmm. into my soul line. The chat room is saying, don't don't hold out that Malcolm Little is not a part of this, i.e. Malcolm X. <laughs> yes. I, 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 he's not South Carolina. He's not South Carolina, though. No, he's I, I, my I, neighborhood. I was, I, I, I was going to add that I have a friend, uh, Edward Bostic, whose folks were for Buford. Yes, that look okay. at Buford too. Yes, but definitely kind of spread I, out a little uh, I, I'm, to I'm, see. Go ahead, James. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say like all those like all those surnames she said are on my family tree. Like I just mentioned at the beginning of this episode, I had Reverend Hightower. Um, I am a Morgan, so I'm actually curious if she's on Jedmatch or not because I'd be I, I I'd be very curious to know if I was actually related to her. Um, also, I would recommend that she join the, there's a Facebook page called The Home Place. And if she's not a part of that page, join it because she will find that some of those surnames she's looking for, those people are on that page. Okay. And uh, Ellen actually posted a link to uh, uh, slavery data um that was posted on roots web and this was actually from sankofa jen it's a site i'm a contributor to uh that mentions the norris family um which also mentions young bloods which i know that's a bernice area mm -hmm. as well Good so not forget about Aphrogenius and to go into those forums because mm -hmm. there's edgefield discussions and things mm -hmm. on there also and start posing questions because again just like we're here and here there's three people right here four that have same surnames same area so mm -hmm. i think there's some more work to be done on who who else is already researching those areas i right. think too i think there's also a lack of of doing on-site research that's that's what yeah what, what, <laughs> what, what screams to me that's is that this key. yeah i think a lot of the queries that we get on ask mariah a lot of them could be solved or could could you know progress forward if folks had actually gone either to the state archives or to the municipality or the court county parish whatever and gone on site to do research or even potentially potentially looked at the microfilm for those locations maybe rented them before september 1st from family search <laughs> or uh you know uh, uh just doing that because you know holding yourself to online research you're only going to find what's online there's a lot of stuff that's not and i'll also add too 
Uh, Shannon brought up earlier in the chat room, he talked about the estate records and things like that that are on family search and they're also on ancestry. The conundrum with those are, yes, it's awesome the research is there or that the records are there, but a lot of that stuff is not indexed. And if you rely on what they indexed, I can speak to this with a lot of certainty in Louisiana where my family's from. I have searched several slaveholders that I know died there. They show up with no result for those estate records. But if I go through the old school way and look at the yes. microfilm and pull up Absolutely. the indexes right. and then go to the pages later, exactly, mm -hmm. those records pop up. So mm -hmm. I just I just bring that up to say, don't rely on the indexes. Don't expect for there to be an index. The sum of this is needle in a haystack and there's no way you can just jump. You can put your hand in and get the needle out and walk away. Yeah. Also, I want to mention to her that there's a newsletter that comes out from the Edgefield genealogical group called the Quell. In the Quell, they have information about African Americans. One of the quells listed those who paid in the poll taxes. So mm -hmm. she may find the, her surnames in those poll taxes. I know I found, and it was 1900, I found my great grandfathers, both of them in there. So these are things that you don't find online, but you're gonna, you will find from your genealogical society. And since she's doing South Carolina research, don't forget this is an online resource. That's the South Carolina Archives online database. You go in there, you put in your surname and just wait to see what might pop up. If they have a record, you could turn around and order the original record. So that's something to look at. And finally, there's the slave records of Edgefield County this is a book that was published by uh, the late Glory Ramsey, and it is now online at, uh, on Ancestry. So if she puts in her, her surname <laughs> for Edgefield, she might see some names pop up. We, she's also, we're also dealing with potentially, um, Bessie is a, is a black hole birth um, oh, you know, okay. in terms of, you know, when she was born, black hole meaning, you know, between 1881 and, and 1899, where yeah. there is no census available. So you, that's where you have to use additional records to supplement that time period. You can't just expect for there to be a census or something to pop up. Um, and then her parents would have been maybe, you know, uh, uh, born during Reconstruction. Uh, so there may have been a surname change. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it may be that they were really boss sticks or high towers and the last slaveholder they had was a little. Uh, something that I would do is I would actually search for the combination of those surnames along with planter or plantation to see if the uh, the white plant plantation or slaveholding families intermarried and then maybe a person died. So that would go back to what Bernice was talking about with estate records and what to search for in terms of papers, because then you can then see, OK, well, if this person died in 1860. 1860 and I know that Ellis was born ap approximately 1868 and, and it was going you know the slaves were bequeathed from a little to a Anderson or Anderson right. to a little right. that would then provide you with proof she also brought up DNA look at where you're where you're it's all about patterns that's the only yes. way you're going to get through when it comes to DNA you know box everyone together see how many bostics you have and do they come from the same people within those bostic matches find out how those folks are related to each other within those high tower matches find out how those folks are related to each other and then that will drive how you determine how you fit in with that particular group is there anything else you want to talk about before we get to current events because we've got four of them tonight um, i would also say um there is the, there, is, there was the high tower um dna project that was going on uh, so you may even want to get in touch with the folks, with the folks who were doing that, because I, I, I made sure to do that. And sure enough, uh, my brown skin, you know, Zulu warrior yourself, sure enough, matched a whole bunch of those people. So Y chromosome. I was about to say Y chromosomal, and and I they I just discovered this. Uh, me and Angela have a project in the works for uh, Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes that you can actually put together an autosomal project on family tree DNA. Now that oh, wasn't awesome. that wasn't a, always an option. So uh, James, you could start your own high tower group if you test there. 
I know. Ha, 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 ha. Evil laugh. All right. So, Judy, um, uh, let's see. Uh, Tyrone Craft. We just need to have Tyrone on one night because he tries to act like he doesn't know anything. And he does. Yes, I agree. <laughs> he, he says Littles had a large plantation in North Carolina called Carlisle in Richmond County. So mm -hmm. that may be something um, to look at when it comes to that. So, Judy, thank you so much for entrusting us with your genealogy research and your question. Uh, and you know, you as a, as a watch a viewer of our show, you have the opportunity to have your genealogy question, uh, query conundrum uh, answered by us live during an episode of Black Pro Gen Live. The way to get that done is check the description of each and every recording of Black Pro Gen Live. You'll see a link to submit to Ask Mariah, and perhaps you will be the next person that will be featured on our episode. Thanks so much, Judy, for sending us your question and your information. All right, so we're going to get to current events. We're going to jump right in. Of course, the number one thing that has happened this week that's a big, big, big thing for all of us is the fact that Family Search has decided to discontinue their microfilm circulation. As of uh, September 1st, 2017, Family Search will discontinue its microfilm distribution services. The last day to order microfilm will be August 31st, 2017. How does this impact you? This impacts you because we were just mentioning looking at microfilm rolls, renting them from Family Search, having them sent to your local Family Search library. That will no longer be an option after September 1st. What that means is they plan on having um, they, they, their efforts to digitize have been increased, and they said that the remaining films that they have should be digitized by the end of 2020. So within three years, they plan for all the rolls of microfilm they have to be digitized, which to me is crazy because I remember when they started this uh, project, they said it was going to take, you know, 50 million years, however long it was, to digitize everything. And then now they're saying in three years they're going to be done. So what, what's, your, what's you all's uh, response to this? Because this has been some pretty big news for us over the last couple days I, th I think that it's a temporary um inconvenience but in the long term i mean nobody's going to care if they actually are digitizing everything because then you'll have access to it and you won't have to go anywhere but um i'm quite sure even like for myself i'm quite sure that like within the next six months i'm going to realize darn it i should have taken you know had this sent to me when i could have back in the summer and i didn't do it so i mean i think it's a good thing ultimately but it's going to be an inconvenience for a while Anyone else want to chime in? It's a huge inconvenience. I mean, I, I, there's already records that they've pulled because um, they had, uh, they had to negotiate with the with the Catholic Church of Puerto Rican Church records. They used to be on there online, and then you get them one day, and then they're all, all pulled, except for maybe like I don't know, ten parishes. And now there's been an effort to put up some additional parishes, but these were later, and they're not even indexed. And, um, and then now they've pulled the images off of Family Search for the civil registration. And when I've asked repeatedly about, you know, when do you, when do you process these records in Puerto Rico, they, they, they can't give me any kind of date. But uh, anything for Europe just keeps rolling out, which I find a little disturbing. So I don't know, you know, maybe it's more complicated than them just getting it out there. But, well, uh, for, well you know. from what we've heard, the reason why they this is happening is because it's no longer economically sound for right. them to keep protecting oh, the records on microfilm. The cost yeah. of the reels and everything, and that there's only one manufacturer of the microfilm left. But um, but this is also like a, a longer issue that's been going on for Puerto Rican records since you know uh, almost o almost a decade now. Okay, so this is not. I mean, it, it's just in there with this. Well, I think my my big thing was the fact that, you know, yes, we I like to be able to go to the film, go and look at the film, my leisure when when the when the office is open. And then, you know, of course, we've got that uh, that you know, lag time for three years. You know, I just feel like Mississippi's gonna always be last because it always yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff never, it is just, Mississippi drags their feet on everything. Uh, you know, so I feel like, oh, well, I'm gonna have the last counties, the last parishes in the whole country. I'm, it's gonna be, you know, uh, December 31st, <laughs> 2019, or to, you know, to 2020 before my stuff gets on. I think that's the fear that everybody has, but this is the way that the world is going. Um, so, you know, this is just what has to happen. Yes, Ms. Shelley. Okay, question. And it might be a rumor, but I hope somebody can clarify it. If we got that deadline of, what was it, August 31st? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it true that you could go ahead and order what you need to order and get it to the local um, family history center and it would stay? Yes. That, okay. I, I so believe I think that that's the case. I think that's, that that's also the case. A great opportunity. Think ahead, folks. What you research and get that stuff to your local family history center and you'll still have access. Yes, because that, that's something else that I needed okay. to read. That's a part of the, uh, uh, when approved by priesthood leaders, centers may continue to maintain microfilm collections already on loan from Family Search after microfilm ordering ends. Centers have the option to return microfilm that is available online or otherwise not needed. So, so I think there's some homework that needs to be done, you know, um, for where you're researching or where groups are researching and start getting some of that local and have that conversation because that's a great resource, yeah. um, you know, to get it local. So, you know, I don't know yeah. about Mississippi, but, you know. <laughs> We're going to pray for Mississippi, y'all. Lauderdale, that's the and county I research. We are going to pray. We are going to pray. All right. So anyway, so, that was all I had to say. Yeah, to say I think that. I think that is a great suggestion, though, is yeah. if, you, you know, if you have a society, if your genealogical society mm -hmm. has a number of people or a group that that, you know, rent microfilm, because because the other thing we have to consider is I know that if a certain film gets rented a certain number of times for Family Search mm -hmm. before this time period, they will make a permanent film to stay at that particular family right. search library or family history center um if it, if it, i forget the number of times so there may be some films that are already permanent there but i would say since we have this coming down the pike consider who's researching where in your in your uh society and get that film there before that deadline to see if they could potentially just keep it there for right. you right also you need to check what's happening with the various uh societies and family history centers some have already done an analysis and determined that people are not using the microphone anymore. correct it doesn't make any sense for you to go and try to order one when they're trying to get rid of those that are there. Correct. So you first make the phone call. What are you all going to, going to do? Correct. Are you going to send yours back or are you going to keep them on file? And then determine who's going to start ordering. And if you're going to do it, sure. you need to do it within Absolutely. the next few weeks. You don't need to wait until it actually happens. Agree. So Agree. All right, moving on to the next current event for the evening. All right, so here's the next one. This is something that just came down the pike. Incoming Georgetown student struggles to pay for her school that sold her family into slavery. Mm. So basically what happened, Elizabeth Thomas, um, through her maternal line, she uh, is a member of the Georgetown 272. And uh, as a part of the, I guess, atonement, uh, I don't want to call it proceedings, the atonement process, uh, Georgetown agreed to admit a certain you know, number or admit students that were descendants of the Georgetown 272. And of course that was great, but there was no follow-up piece to this that ensured that they would be provided additional financial aid, considering the fact that a number of, of them cannot afford to go to Georgetown considering the expense that it is. I know that Elizabeth Thomas, her and her brother were admitted. She was admitted for graduate studies. Her brother was admitted for undergraduate studies. Uh, and they, neither one of them can afford to go to the school and it doesn't appear as though Georgetown is trying to help them secure any additional aid. Your thoughts on this? Um, I think I posted in Black Pro Gen Live what was more interesting than the story was all the comments that followed that article. It was the most horrific stuff I had ever seen. And, and it was, it, I, I don't even have words to say, except read the comments. You know, I mean, this is telling you the mood of the country right now, based on some of those comments that were so ridiculous, so far out there in left field, and also the negative piece to it. And I actually didn't see any positive comments on after that article. So, you know, I, I don't know if they should be paying full tuition. You know, did they go there knowing it's $30,000 a year or whatever it is they do? I, I don't know. I don't know. This is a deeper conversation. I'm, I'm 
I'm sorry, but I thought it was supposed to be a free ride. No, it wasn't. I never no, read that. No, they why. never. They never said, they never said that. That's not okay. what I think they. I think that they just. They just rode the wave that people Tuition were going to assume assistance that. Or yeah, they. Oh, they okay. claim. They claim yeah. that, but that's not. I mean, if the yeah. school costs fifty thousand a year. Exactly. You know, especially if you're already, you know, uh, uh, you've already completed a degree. Like, let's say, you know, I've got family from that area. So does Bernice. Yeah. We could easily, just, you know, determine if our ancestor was part of those 272. Sure. Let's say she decides she wants to go back and get a doctorate degree. I, I decide I want to go and get a master's. Well, it's easier to get scholarships as an undergrad than it is a graduate or, or you know, a graduate right. student. So, That's right. You know, so um, I think that, uh, yeah, I, I, that's the, this, the thing that to me that's just troubling about this is like, yes, I appreciate the gesture, but yes. what good is it really doing mm -hmm. if the people who are able to apply and get in cannot afford to go? It just stays an empty gesture then. And exactly. It, exactly. Right, it does. It does. It, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And why bother? And it's something that needed to really have really, really been... Um, plan better so that the expectations that they would have more assistance than what they actually have shouldn't this shouldn't even hit the newspaper i uh, am yeah. um, it's, yeah. it's just too early for this i mean they just they, don't know where the, it's going. they just went through the tournament and and, and the yeah. ceremony and announcing the scholarships and I, I just wish it hadn't even hit the newspaper so that yeah. they could work it out privately to yeah. deal with it. This was somebody looking to sensationalize something to me. I don't I don't know. Mm. Mm. And hence surprised. you hence you're getting these negative comments. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm not surprised by it. I mean to me it's just a, it's just an example of the you know, other things in society where uh our folks were uh were abused and, and misused or what have you and then um and people don't really make any real attempt to make good on it at all. Um, and then they try to blame the person and say, well, something's wrong with you. Well, mm -hmm. no, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a jacked situation, however you look at it, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'm not surprised. I, I think I would liken it to, yes, you can register to vote, but you need to find a qual two qualified white voters to say that, that you're eligible and that you are who you okay. are. Or actually, no, you are qualified to vote, but you have to have a grandfather that was not born a slave. Or wait, hold on, you're qualified to vote, but you have to pass this test in order to make sure that you know the preamble to the constitution, that you're able to name your county leaders, blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh, oh wait, 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 no. You're eligible to vote, but the clerk's not gonna be at the office the day that you're gonna go to sign to vote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've seen that, it all before. Yes. Yeah. Her, yeah, okay, in the words of, I don't even know her name, heard it all before. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> Same stuff. <laughs> all right, yeah. moving forward. This was a hilarious case. Oh, Thank you, yeah. Ellen. Yeah. Thank you, Ellen, for, <laughs> for this one. I enjoyed this one. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, so you all can read it in The Guardian, which I love The Guardian. If you are yeah. not following any foreign news services, I would highly suggest reading The Guardian <laughs> and The Independent yeah. that are based out of uh, the UK. because yeah. They've got some great, I feel like they have some great coverage of American uh, news that we're not getting. And also just some of these, you know, just things that they just don't cover in American media, but court orders Salvador Dali's body to be exhumed for paternity test. This is crazy. The man died in what, 1960 something? Yeah. I think it was. And there's a woman who claims that she is his descendant. And in order to stop her from suing the estate and whatever, they have ordered for his body to be exhumed. Mm -hmm. DNA. Actually, DNA. Yeah, for the, for the DNA. For the DNA. Uh, I, actually, uh, maybe he died in the 90s. I can't remember because, you know, it, it wasn't that long. It was in the 80s. It. it was in the 80s. Yeah, the 80s. it was in the 80s. Yeah. 80s? Yeah. yeah. It was in the 80s. I'm wondering now, especially with autosomal DNA testing, <laughs> if this is going to be the norm, especially if folks are trying to prove that they have some sort of lineage tied to some of these people. Do you guys think they're going to be absorbing bodies all over the, all over the place? It's no. coming. Why not? Uh, well, mm -hmm. it's, all, it's, it's too much this. money. Yeah. This it, is it this is. is all about the dollars. Yeah. It is. It is. Shannon, it is. Shannon wants to know who Salvador Dali is. Uh, he's, he's an, an artist. He's an artist. He's a very he's a famous artist. He's a realist painter. Yeah, I'm a surrealist artist. 
Nika, I would I would say that we're more likely to have, let's say, funeral directors taking swabs before. Uh, oh, uh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. Well, 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 I remember um, not too long ago they, they had exhumed the body or they found the body of um, one of the kings of England. I think I want to say it was Henry II or something like that. And they yeah. um, they were actually able to use DNA testing yeah. to show how he was show that the body was actually him. So, I mean, I think it's I think it's a, it can be a good thing, but I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be like mainstream. Um, mm -hmm. I am interested because we never did. I, I, I never found. Um, the follow-up story regarding Nat Turner's skull that they said they found. They were doing DNA testing on that, and I never saw the results. It was results. returned to the family, wasn't it? Oh, the yes, DNA. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was going to add, as the granddaughter of uh, someone who was a funeral director, damn, if I knew now, then what I know now, <laughs> I'd be having a new revenue stream for they, my granddaddy. They, they roll the body in. Here comes Teresa <laughs> with the swab. She's like, all right. <laughs> It'll be a whole new you revenue know, stream. Somebody said, somebody said that he had an extra daughter, so go ahead, open his mouth real wide. We get that sample out. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be encouraging that. <laughs> DNA testing at the end. Yeah. Girl, look, hey, we could talk offline about that, honey. <laughs> Post-mortem autosomal DNA. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> Now, get your buddy, get your buddy, get your buddy. I need a new group of friends. Okay. <laughs> You're stuck with us. It's too late. <laughs> Mr. Y, you're holding oh, your ground. Lord. Oh, my Lord. All right. And uh, the last story for Ask Mariah, of course, or not Ask Mariah, I'm giving my, my segments mixed up. Last story on current events, which is the one that I just really want to just, yeah. just... Yeah. Yeah, this is just not okay. Uh, Clarion Ledger, major publication in Mississippi, is reporting that another Emmett Till sign uh, commemorating what happened to him in Mississippi has been defaced. If you recall, uh, some months ago, the sign that was up near the river or the near the spot in the river where he was discovered with the fan tied around him, that sign has repeatedly been vandalized and uh, it was shot through. Uh, they've had to replace it a number of times. Now there's another sign that was actually first put up during uh, when they created the Mississippi Freedom Trail. It's a trail that you can take throughout the state and go to different you know, points of interest in the civil rights movement. Uh, that trail was, I believe it was unveiled in 2011. It coincided with the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. I know my, my family actually went on the different stops. They took them all around to those, including to this location in uh, Money where uh, this, this sign actually exists outside of the store where the alleged incident took place. And in addition to is this, in this instance, it's not just uh, defaced. They actually took the time to scrape off all of the wording and erase everything that was on the sign. So the first sign was shot through and defaced. This one, the writing, all the writing and the photos were completely scraped off. Can I ask why this memorial was done with vinyl lettering to begin with? Like, why isn't this like a, was it just a cost thing? I mean, it just seems like, geez, for such a moment, why not have something permanent that you can't, really can't mess with? I think what they, what they, uh, what they did was, um, I've seen these historical markers that look just like this. We've all seen them throughout the country. Some of the yeah. older ones have like hand placed letters, you know, like you can run your hand around the very tactile. Others mm -hmm. are just flat. The newer ones are just flat. And I think it is a, it is a cost uh, saving thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think at the point at which they, they placed this marker, this is 2011. Uh, uh, this one was the second one. This, you know, the first one was right, right where his body was found. So yeah. uh, that one uh, was flat as well. But you, know, like I said, that one had had you know bullets shot through That's it. Shot. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, let's be honest. We are in a, a very racist political climate now, and we're okay. seeing the rise not That's only amazing. of this desecration, but of many. You yes. know, people are so much freer to think they can say things that five, 10 years ago, they didn't say to our mm -hmm. faces. So right. our we The door was opened. Again, we are in Jim Crow 2.0. Yeah. Okay, let, let's be real. And we mm -hmm. won't even discuss the fact that the woman lied, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's true. It, it, this yeah. is nothing but intimidation. Mm -hmm. Trying to put us in the place and the woman lied. I and agree. People got away with it. Yeah. I, I think this is why, this is why I, we have to tell our ancestors stories. We have to mm -hmm. tell the truth. 
I think you're I think you're absolutely right. And I think the other there's another piece of this as well is, you know, I, I was reading through the comments, you know, where folks are just like, why in the world are people doing this? Blah, blah, blah. And several folks came in and chimed in and said, oh, um, well, of course, this happens because you removed our Confederate monument and you erased our Confederate history. So why on earth would, you know, would you get to keep this towards this, this situation? Because you, it's a horrible time period. And, and, and why would we want to maintain that? This is basically, they tried to say that, that the Confederate monuments was the same as this Emmett Till situation. Well, yeah, or like today they have the uh, the Tampa courthouse. There's a there's a Confederate statue that there was a, a pastor there with his with a whole group of people to to just kind of bring attention to the fact that why is this still here? Why do we still have to walk by this? Whatever thing we're going to do, register to vote, register our births, register our papers, we shouldn't have to do this. And then they 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 put on some guide and said, oh, it's because you're going to take away our history. But then he completely erases everybody else. It was, um, he, he had no recognition uh, that there were anybody else besides, you know, uh, Confederate soldiers and, and, I mean, black people didn't exist, let me put it that way. Which I was just kind of like, really? This is like 2017? I was like, you, I was just kind of like, oh, please. You would, you would think, I pulled up the article, this, the first defacing um, with the bullet holes happened in October of 2016. Right. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. as I mentioned, it was in the it was at the river location where his body uh, what was was found. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know what? At this point, oh, I just really? wonder, like, you know, what what do you say when people when they try to liken a murder to a participation trophy? Right. I don't engage. Right. It's a waste of my time. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm but, we, but we've got to we've got to live and interact with these people, you all. True, true. But but in terms of replying to people's ignorant comments, I won't do that. Oh okay. yeah, no. I, 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 as I said multiple times, when it comes to dealing with my answer, it's going to be the truth. It's going to be discussing these events, and these are not new events. These are they, You know, we can go back. 200, 300, four years ago when racial intimidation was an everyday occurrence. And in some places it's becoming that. So we either maintain our silence or we speak up for those who are no longer here to speak up for themselves. And we speak up for those who today, you know, I, 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 I don't know if you saw this on Facebook last week, but there was a little nine-year-old girl in Washington who did like a, a, a Facebook uh, presentation about how she's being bullied about her being black. And I'm like, you know, those are the people I need to speak to, yes. not the perpetrators of, of this intimidation tactics. It's those young black kids who, who are living in this time frame who may not be able to cope because it's all totally the social media stuff. You're, you're dealing with kids committing suicide, kids overdosing you know the the online bulletin we need to be able to speak to those kids i don't worry about those haters i can't well as a genealogist i mean we've got to be we've got to be real about this and and bernice raises a great question you know how can we as genealogists use these incidences in in reference to the confederate monuments in reference to what's happened with the markers commemorating emmett till you know to me i fully anticipate that they're going to do something to the cheney goodman and schwerner uh, marker, if they're going to do it to to uh, to Emmett Till's marker, how can we use these incidences to help people with their genealogy research and and to inform our own genealogy research? Because well, we can't we can't sweep them underneath the rug. We can't. No. Well, you have what you have to do is you, with, uh, from a genealogy perspective, you have to continue to tell the stories um, exactly. in, in your in your own ways. Um, my, myself being being distantly related to um, to Rosa Parks, uh, one thing that I did not know that there's been such a problem with is that um, people have actually not just defaced the sign of her um, childhood home, they've actually like stolen it, put it in the truck, and like drove off with it and threw it in the river and like all type of stuff like that. Um, and this has been going on for a number of years now. Um, so you you know I, I think the, the best thing you can do is to, outside of you know arming yourself. 
uh, is is making sure you continue to tell the stories um, so that that the younger generations uh, know the truth and, and and have the and have our perspective on things. Because if you don't tell the story, then you're letting the other people win at the end of the day. Exactly, and we we have to be able to link our past stories of our ancestors to what is happening today. Right. And I think that's a critical point that, you know, I, I, I and I'm gonna bring up, I'm, right now I'm, I'm doing all this preliminary research for my blog post, The DNA Trail from Madagascar to Charles City, Virginia, which is Shirley Plantation. Okay, five colonial lines in Virginia, I have no, no, no roots that I know of south of Virginia. But yet, I have all these DNA cousins, right? Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia. And again, I never realized until I did this research that Richmond was such a major slave trading depot. Oh, yeah. And 350,000 Virginia slaves were sold south, right? Um, we need to be able to link, I'm reading about slave auctions, slave jail, horrific Lumpkins. things. Exactly. Horrific things going, that when I think of people denying that Black Lives Matter, okay? Mm -hmm. And right. when you go back and you look at the history, we need to be able to look and make ties past to present. There's a continuation that we all represent from our ancestors to our descendants right now. And it's it's we do our ancestors and we make them proud by telling their true stories. And it has to be true stories. And and nothing happens in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing today is just a continuation. So in my blog post, I it, it's, it's not gonna be a pretty one, okay? I am the descendant of slave and slave owners in the North, entirely different system of slavery. Than Absolutely. What I'm Absolutely. Now. So, and yeah. I have to be able to tell and speak to those ancestors whose voices have never been heard before. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I think you all are, are absolutely right. I think the huge opportunity in this is there's got to be the neutral ground, right? You know, if you are a descendant of both slave and slaveholder, if you are a descendant of free people of color, whoever you are, when you are writing about or you are telling these stories, recounting what you're finding in your family history research, say that you don't, that's what you have so far. Don't put a stamp on it that that's exactly it unless you know that that's exactly it because you know even just yesterday i was reading a newspaper account where this person it was written in 1900 maybe i should share this because he was talking about new year's day and what used to happen in the south on new year's day and how the the slave women used to make these applejack pies and bring them to the courthouse square and sell them that day and how you know the colored folks were off for two weeks and they would go and whatever little money they had they would go buy things and then there was all this hyperbole in there about how happy black folks were during that time period and mm -hmm. someone had gone and clipped this article on the website that i was using and i was wondering what it doesn't mention anybody's name how is this informing your research mm -hmm. because we had to consider oh they're thinking it's historical it was written at the time it's got to be true not thinking that this is during the time period that that you know that slavery era research or that whole time period was being reconstructed historically speaking for the masses to consume and then pass the bad information down generation by generation so there is power in sharing uh and sharing our story so um good discussion tonight you all and i just want to move on into our last bit of discussion for the evening don't forget to join us we have several episodes happening uh before uh the summer is over and you'll notice we'll be here with you three times out of the month out, you know, normally we're with you for two episodes a month, but during the summer, during June, July, and August, we're having three episodes a month. So be sure to make sure that you set your reminder so you know when the episodes are happening. Our next episode is Wednesday, July 5th. We'll be talking about people of color in the Northeast, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. People of color communities thrive on social media. <laughs> yes, these are great locations. Of course, this is all Teresa's area. <laughs> so don't forget to join us Wednesday, July 5th, same time, uh, same bad channel.
Also, just reminding you, we've also got uh, episodes coming up. We've got our July 12th episode, which is on a Wednesday. Last, the episode I just announced, which is July 5th, is also on a Wednesday because, well, we don't expect for you to show up on the 4th of July when you're eating your ribs, drinking your soda, or doing whatever you're going to do uh, and, and join us for Black Pro Gym Live. I know I will probably be the only panelist out here with probably James and True if I expected everybody to show up on July 4th. So the next episode is on a Wednesday. The episode following that is on a Wednesday and we'll be broadcasting live from the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute taking place in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Following that, we've got people of color in Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and Ohio. That's Tuesday, July 25th. We've got, well, you know, privacy in genealogy and DNA taking place Tuesday, August 8th, followed by people of color in Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, and Missouri on Tuesday, August 22nd. Also, don't forget there is an episode of Research at the National Archives and Beyond with Bernice, Ta Bernice Alexander Bennett. This week's episode is African American History Etched in My DNA with Andre Kearns, taking place 6 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m. on Thursday, June 29th, 2017. We also have the next iteration of the African Roots Podcast with Angela Walton Raji, which will be posted to her site, AfricanRootsPodcast.com, on Friday, June 30th. Don't forget also to check out Mondays with Mert and Wacky Wednesday with Arginia Bud, Dear Myrtle, which those take place every Monday and Wednesday. Also, if you manage to miss Research at the National Archives and Beyond or the African Roots podcast, then you... I mean, you, that must mean you must have subscribed to the lowdown by Black Pro Gen because if you do and you miss the episode, the links to listen to either one of those things will pop up in your inbox. So if you're not subscribed, go right on ahead and go over. The link to subscribe is in the description and of uh, any recording of this and uh, any episode of Black Pro Gen Live. Don't forget also to join the conversation. Tweet us at Black Pro Gen. Hashtag your tweets, Black Pro Gen, to make sure we see them. Add your comments, questions, queries, whatever it is. Uh, let us know you're out there and you're listening to what our lovely spiritual group has to say. So before we get on for the evening, any closing thoughts for anybody on any of the topics we discussed this evening? I just love the fact that you called us a lowly spiritual group. <laughs> what did you say? I, said, I just love the fact that you just called us a lovely spiritual group. Oh, spirited. I said spirited. Oh, spir spir oh spirited. spirited. I said spiritual. Yes. I was, oh, I, was no, gonna, I, was, I was gonna get my choir my choir robe on. He <laughs> was. He was like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> A lovely day. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Get your claps. Sorry, I didn't have my, my, my tambourine. All right. Well, everyone, thanks so much for hanging on with this. Renata, you made it, girl. Yes, you did. You made it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. She made it through the whole episode. We're so proud of her. Uh, we didn't we didn't know she was gonna make it, but she she held on with us. So on behalf of everyone, uh I am Nika Smith, your host troublemaker all those things in between uh true lewis say what's up she's been manning the she's been manning all comments twitter everything gotta give a shout out to her as well as teresa vega they're in new york true's in kentucky shelly is in virginia renata is in virginia james is in virginia the whole panel's in virginia i'm kidding uh, ellen is sleepy in virginia we're sleepy <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah. wanted to give a shout out to all my um, sisters in D.C. They're celebrating our Continental Congress in Washington, D.C. for 2017. So shout out to all my darlings there. and Shelly, our resident panelists. She'll be there representing us, too. So. All right. She's talking about the Daughters of the American Revolution, D.A.R. We have two members of D.A.R. The D. women of house. color. Yes. Shelly, I walk around the corner from Constitution Hall. If I don't get a phone call, I'll be offended. Oh. <laughs> All right. He and he I put himself call you. He put himself on mute after that. Like you don't even get to <laughs> a debate on this one. Uh, for me, Nika Smith, Ella Fernanda Sacco in Florida, Bernie Spinnett right there in Maryland. We love you all. We'll see you next Wednesday, July 5th for people of color in the Northeast. Have a great weekend. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye.